Well, good morning, Cross Point Church. Isn't it a great day to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah. Amen. Just what an exciting time of worship here. Uh, I just, before we dive into the message, before we really go any further, could we just show a little bit of appreciation for our choir this morning and our, uh, our worship team? I tell you, it's just so exciting to, to see that and, uh, and to be a part of just such a, a, a service that's just so alive. And, and uh, I tell you, my heart is full already this morning just thinking about the things that we have uh, sang about and just knowing that, that God has been praised this morning. It's just so wonderful. If you're visiting with us here today, we are super glad that you're here. We recognize that, that you could have chosen a million places to be this morning, maybe not a million, but a lot. And, uh, and, and, but you chose to be here, and we're thankful for that. We appreciate you being here in any way we can help you and answering any questions. We're always here for you and glad to do that. We're just so appreciative that you are here today. And I, I'm also just very excited. i got to say this before we go any further. Uh, starting tomorrow is our DP camp, which is our Discovery Point camp. And we have over 300 children registered for that event. That's not even counting who's going to show up in the morning and make, uh, make registration table just a nightmare. But, I, I, but it's, it's awesome to, uh, to just be a part of just such excitement. Uh, the kids are wanting to be a part of, uh, of our camp this week. And, and as I think about that, I just have to say this because I, I think it's just so wonderful. I want to go ahead in advance and thank our volunteers. And here's why. Before we even got registration up, we had enough volunteers to take care of the entire camp. Amen? And so I just want to say, before we even get started, thank you so much for your willingness to, to be here this week, to pour into the children. I have been praying and I believe that God is going to do something really spectacular in the lives of many of those children, maybe even in those volunteers. And so uh, I, just, uh, I just thank you so much for your willingness to be a part of that. Um, we are officially into summer, right? We are officially into summer. And it, it's, uh, the, the reason I know that is because it's 180 outside with about 200% humidity, right? I mean, it is so hot. I walked out on our back porch the other day and I, I just did a U-turn and came right back in and just stood at the back door and looked out because it was, I said, I can't even go outside. It's just miserable. But we are officially into summer. I know that means a lot of people are away and traveling and, and all this kind of stuff. But, but this morning, we are going to be kicking off a great summer series. It's a short one. It's only four weeks. But I believe this is going to be a really great summer series for us to go through. And what we're calling it, uh, this series, is Replenish replenish. And I'll get more into that as we dive into each, uh, each individual sermon. But we're talking about living life from a healthier place. Living life from a healthier place. Now, I know that there's a lot that we think about when we think of that word healthier. And obviously, uh, physical health might be one of those things. But I'm really talking about spiritual health. Living life from a spiritually healthy place and knowing that Christ has, has called us to be a part of this unique and wonderful relationship with him. And, and, and what does it mean for the believer, for the follower of Christ Jesus who is walking out his faith with Christ? There is this reoccurring conversation that I seem to always have with others, many of you that are here today. It's a reoccurring conversation that we, we seem to talk about uh, sometimes every week. And this conversation is about the extreme busyness of life. How many of you would agree with me this morning that life is overwhelming? Amen? Life is busy, busy, busy. I see some of you looking at others that you came in with this morning like, boy, is this lesson for you. It's actually for all of us because I really haven't met anyone who, uh, who has really slowed down enough in life to just not call themselves busy. But, but the reality is this is a conversation that, that I have with a lot of people. 
including my own self. I mean, I, I, not that I just sit around talking to myself, but, but you know, as I, as I process life, as I think about life, I mean, this is something I think about a lot. So the question might be this. So how do we prioritize? How do we prioritize? How do we slow down? How do we develop Christ-centered rhythms in our life? And we're going to be talking about that in this series a pastor and author named Lance Witt, he once wrote this. He said, he said, it is not easy to slow down our lives. Despite all the lamenting about how busy we are and the pace we maintain, we seem to like the adrenaline rush of a full life. Even when we would like to get off the treadmill, we're not even sure what we would give up. And that seems to be the conversation that I have with so many people as we think about how we need to prioritize the things in our life that are important. And it just seems like everything that we don't want in our life is what's piled on, making it impossible to do the things that we, we want to do, whether it's spend time with the Lord, spend time with our children, our families, so on. And so I hope this series is going to be one that is a, is a great series for us in these four weeks as we look at some really incredible passages of Scripture that are going to teach us, I believe, a lot about what it means to, to just be replenished in Christ. As a Christian, please hear this, as a Christian, there's a real need to establish healthy rhythms and simplicity in our life. Let me say that again. As a Christian, there is a real need, a serious need, to establish healthy rhythms and simplicity in your life. My prayer is, is that as we walk through this, we, Siri's talking to me up here. Uh, I don't know where that came from, but anyway, she's, she's just going to have to wait. But <laughs> y'all didn't hear that, I don't guess, but uh, it was very distracting. She's like, Dave, what do you need? What do you want me to? I'm like, please, please be quiet. I'm, I'm preaching. But anyway, it's my prayer as we dive into this passage to this morning and the others to follow that we can begin to start living from a healthier place, spiritually healthy place. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful, Lord, for this time together, this opportunity that we've had this morning to worship you. Father, there's no doubt that your presence is in this place. God, we know that Lord, as we live out our life as believers and followers of Christ, that, God, you are always there, you are always near, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And, Lord, we find so much comfort in that. But, Father, we also understand that there's a, a real problem in, in our life today, and that is uh, that too often we can get really busy. So busy that it is distracting and distracting us from our relationship with the Lord, with you. And so, Father, we just pray that today as we dive into this text, as we think about this message today, that you would open our hearts and minds, that we would be receptive, God, to the things that you wish to teach us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever felt fatigued, frazzled, or fried? That's the question. Have you ever felt fatigued, frazzled, or fried? Let me ask you this question, rhetorical question. How many of you feel that right now? How many of you last month felt like the whole month was that, you know, as you think about it? You know, just the reality that there's so much in your life that just wears you down, wears you out, overwhelms you, brings you to a place that you just don't feel good about life anymore. Let me ask you this. Maybe you came in this morning and you were wondering, what is it that God wants to teach you about your life? I believe that this message is for you. This message is for us. This message is certainly for me. 
And so I pray that as we look at Luke chapter 10, and that's where we're going to be this morning, Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, that we're going to see what it is that God wants to teach us this morning about our life and the things that are important, developing, if you will, these these healthy rhythms, these Christ-centered rhythms in our life. And so we're going to be looking at this. You know, the reality is I think that most of us in here are in need of recognizing when to be still and delight in the Lord. Amen? Amen. It's it's an almost impossible task to just sit still for a moment and to know that he is God. To sit still for a moment and to just be content and happy and satisfied and full in Christ Jesus, to know that that he is sufficient in our life, to reflect, we were singing about it just a moment ago, but to reflect on what he has done in our life. How many of you this morning would praise Jesus for the wonderful things he has done in your life? Amen? Amen. He is so grateful to us. He is so good to us. And we can celebrate the good things that he has done. And you know, as I think about it, as I think about this passage that we're going to look at, we're, uh, we're also begin to realize it's not always about slowing down and just resting. Sometimes it's often about just finding the right stuff, doing the right stuff, finding those rhythms that we need to find, those Christ-centered rhythms that we're going to be talking about. In our passage today, the story is about two sisters. We have one sister named Martha and one sister named Mary, and many of you are probably familiar with this story. If you grew up in church at all, this is a story that, that is often talked about. It's a, it's a passage that's often preached. It's a, it's a really great reminder to us of some really important things that we need to be aware of. And so this morning, we're going to be diving into this passage. But to offer a little bit of context here, before we dive into it, we need to just sort of recognize what's taking place. Jesus has suddenly come into the community in which Mary and Martha live. He has come into town, and Martha opens up her home to become, hopefully, the best hostess that she can become. In other words, she wants to take care of Jesus as he comes into town. She opens up her home. She invites him in. She begins to prepare the meal. She wants to feed him. She just wants to be a great hostess. But there's a contrast here because, on the other hand, her sister Mary, instead of opening up her home, she opens up her heart. She opens up her heart to Jesus. And what we see is that as Martha is busy getting the things ready that must be accomplished so that they can feed Jesus, as they can host Jesus in their home, Mary simply sits at Jesus' feet and soaks it all in. Look at this passage with me this morning. Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 38. It says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me To serve alone. Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. If you walk out of here, Hearing just one thing this morning, I hope you'll hear this, that the busyness of life will not only distract you, but it will damage your soul. Let me say that again. 
the busyness of life will not only distract you in your relationship with Jesus, but it will damage your soul. That's what this passage is about. I've heard this passage preached so many different ways. I've heard this pres- passage preached in, in so, from so many different angles. And there's a lot to be gleaned from this passage, no doubt. There's a lot to learn here. But there's one truth that really stands out, and that is this, that a distracted life, the busyness of life that causes the distractions in our life, can be damaging to our soul. And this is what we take away from this as we hear the words of Jesus as he speaks into Mary and Martha's life. You know, I've always had sort of a a love-hate relationship with being busy. There have been times in my life where I sort of wore my busyness as a badge of honor. You know, people would approach and they would come up and how's things going? Man, I'm just so busy. I mean, you know, it's just, it's almost as though my validation came from the busyness of my life. And I've always been a busy person. I've always been someone who is driven. I'm always staying busy doing things. But the reality is, is that that's not always a healthy thing. I love being busy, but at the same time, sometimes I feel so overwhelmed by being busy. And the reality is, as we look at this passage, we begin to understand that what Jesus is teaching to Martha specifically in this moment is that there is a better way to live our life, a way in which we can find that spiritual health that we so desperately need in our life. Psalm 46.10 is a passage that is probably the most ignored truth of Scripture that we have ever read. It says this, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. We have a real good way of living life void of this truth in our life. We run out the door. We're on the way to work. And our life from the moment our feet hit the ground in the morning just seems to be consumed with the busyness of life. We've got to get the kids ready. We've got to get them fed. We've got to get them in the car. Oh, we forgot their book bag. Oh, we, you know, and it's out the door and it's, it's fussing and fighting along the way because there's so much stress in our life. Our children are confused. They don't even know what's going on. And we rush out the door. We get them to school school we get to work and then we walk in just minutes before we're running late or maybe we're just a little bit late you know the rest of the story right every single day life just seems to be oh so overwhelming if we allow it but yet this short verse that we just looked at be still and know that I am God this verse It really stands as a powerful charge to modern-day Christianity, doesn't it? Almost an indictment against Christianity today. Be still and know that I am God. This is exactly what we see taking place in Mary's life, and yet Martha was too distracted to enjoy that moment. The Scriptures are very clear about this. We see this. And so the question that we might ask ourselves as we we prepare to dive into this text might be, could it be that in our busyness, in our overachieving lives that we have missed what is so important to us? What is so important to us? Could it be that life is consumed by everything else in the world and there's hardly enough time for Jesus. Now let me just be very clear. I needed this passage. 
I needed to read this passage of Scripture. I needed to be reminded of the truths. Maybe what you're hearing today, I don't think so because I see the, the heads nodding and I see the looks glancing to our spouses and those sorts of things. But maybe I'm the only one in this room that needed to hear this message today. But I have this sneaky feeling that I'm not. Right? What is it that's missing in our life? What is it that's overwhelming to us in our life? So let's look at our passage and let's see what it is that we can learn. I've mentioned this several times, but these Christ-centered rhythms, what I mean by that is, is those spiritual habits, those spiritual disciplines that we incorporate into our life so that they become constants. In other words, if you think about a rhythm, if you think about the band here this morning, you know, there's, there's one person up here that sort of leads the pack, as I've been told. I'm not a musician, but Jordan tells me this. And that's the drummer. There's this boom, 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 boom. It's a constant that the band is able to stay in sync with as they continue to do what they do so well. We need those rhythms in our life. We need those spiritual disciplines, those constants in our life to ensure that we're not being overwhelmed by life, but rather we are living our life the way Christ intended for us to live. And so we look at this story. We begin to see some rhythms that are identifiable here in this text. The first one is this. We must establish our priorities in life. We must establish our priorities in life. What is it that is most important to you? This story is a story of different priorities. I've heard it said that these are perspectives, but they're really not. They're more priorities in their life. We begin to look at Martha first, and we begin to realize about Martha. Her heart was in the right place. Her priorities were all wrong. Martha was someone who was very much thankful that Jesus came into town. She opened up her home. She wanted to serve Jesus. Her heart was in the right place. She was wanting to make an impression on Jesus, not for her own glory, but because she was really thankful for who he was and what he was doing. What she was wanting to accomplish might have come from a good place, a great heart, but her priorities we're all wrong. However, Mary was more concerned with being in the presence of the Lord. She was more concerned about sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so we begin to realize that as we look at this story, we see the contrast between these two different priorities. One, wanting to serve in a capacity that would honor Jesus, but the other just saying, you know what? I don't need to miss out on being in the presence of my Lord. And so we see that in this situation, establishing our own priorities in life must become a rhythm that we embrace as believers and followers of Christ. If we have no concern about living our life in the presence of Christ, then even when we're doing his work, we do it in vain. To serve the Lord outside of a, a crystal clear relationship with him will always be in vain. What is the most important thing? The most important thing is that we know God, that we are in sync with God, that we are walking with Jesus, that we are loving him, and we're not forgetting him in the busyness of our life. You know, Jesus, when he wrote to the church in Ephesus, he had something very similar to say to them. He says this, he says, uh, to the church in Ephesus, he says, I know your works, your toils, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. 
He says, I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But look at verse 4. He says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you first had. It seems that the Ephesians and Martha had something in common, didn't they? Their priorities were a little out of whack. Both busy. Both very busy, even serving the Lord. But the reality is there was no relationship with Jesus. There was a lack of closeness with Jesus. Now, the second thing that we realize if we're looking at these these spiritual rhythms in our life is that we need to also focus our attention on the Word of God. Now, here's the thing. The, the Word of God is, 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 uh, is something that we preach a lot about here. I mean, obviously, the Word of God is something that you should be in. But I think what we see here in this text is something a little bit more profound than just thinking about read your Bible, right? It's a focus on, it's a listening for the Word of God. It's, it's listening to what God wants to tell you. And so I place a lot of emphasis on the word attention here. Focus our attention on the Word of God. Look at verse 39 and 40. It says, and she had a sister, Mary did, called, I mean Martha did, called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and look at this, and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. So it wasn't just that Mary comes to the feet of Jesus, sits down, and just sort of gazes at him in awe. It wasn't that. She was very attentive. Her attention was, listed, was focused on listening to his words. She wanted to glean whatever it was that he had for her. He, she wanted to hear what truths he was speaking as it related to her life. It wasn't that she just sat there sort of in admiration of Christ, but rather she was attentive to the things that he was teaching in that moment. And then we look at, Mary, at Martha, and we see that even though Jesus was rebuking Martha, Martha uh, his words just seemed to be very calming to me. Uh, he, he, it says here uh, that Martha was distracted, and, 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 and yet when we look on down, he, he, he seems to rebuke her, but there just seems to be a calming nature about it. But, it. but I think it's really interesting what the Word of God is teaching us as we look at this because we begin to realize that there's a focus on listening to God. You know, I was looking up this word distracted. What does it mean? Martha was distracted. What does this word mean? It, it literally means to be unable to concentrate because one's mind is preoccupied. And I started thinking about all the things that Martha might be thinking in this moment. She might have been feeling a little bit of jealousy because she's in there getting dinner ready and Mary's in there just sitting there watching Jesus and listening to Jesus. Maybe there was a little bit of jealousy involved there. Maybe there was a little bit of bitterness there. Maybe there was bitter and anger that was sort of welling up in her heart. Maybe there was a, a sense of, I don't know why I'm doing this. Jesus is in there with everybody else. I, you know, maybe there was a little bit of self-pity that was moving into the equation. But the reality was... In her, her mind, she was distracted by what was happening in the other room while she was preparing the meal. And so we need to understand this, that our focus, our attention needs to be on the Word of God. We cannot leave that out of the daily rhythms in our life. Words of one unknown uh, author, I don't know who wrote this, but I, I love what he had to say, or she had to say. He said, amid the maintaining of a 1,500-calorie diet, picking up the kids from soccer practice, and keeping our car insurance current, we can somehow lose touch with what is really important. We become like robots rapidly moving from one task to the next. We are overworked, overstressed, and spiritually undernourished. Woo! Who made these rules anyway? Is that how you feel sometimes? 
It's how I feel sometimes. It's like, what in the world are we doing? Why is life like this? And I think it's in all of that that we have somehow become, in the same way Martha has, distracted about that which is hugely important for us as believers. Mary was listening to the teachings of Jesus. Her focus was on the spiritual food that was available to her rather than worrying about a physical meal. You know, if we're going to be wise, if we're going to be knowledgeable, if we're going to know Jesus and we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to if we're going to be that type of believer, we're going to have to focus our attention on the Word of God. There must be that time in our, in our lives, in our daily lives, where we, where we spend time in the Word of God. King David once said this. He says, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is a promise that he is making to the Lord. He says, Lord, above everything else, this is what is important to me. Paul said it like this. He said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I love the fact that Paul says, think about these things. It's about the mind thinking about the things that are in our life, thinking about the processes that we go through on a daily basis as we live out our life. Busy it can be, but what are our focuses? What are our priorities? And, and is it on Jesus and the Word of God? The last thing I want to share with you here this morning, what we see here, and I, I suppose may be the most important, is that we must draw near to Jesus. We must draw near to Jesus. You know, there are times in our life where we pray. There's times when we spend time with the Lord. But there is a critical need for us to press into our Savior, to draw near to the Lord, to be close to the Lord, to spend time with the Lord, to allow the Lord to speak into our life that we may grow wise and knowledgeable and know Him. And so we see this in this passage. Look at verse 41 and 42. It says, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. What is it that Mary's done? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus, and she's listening to the word of Christ. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She has drawn near to God. When, when Jesus came into that room, she saw it as the most important thing in her life to draw near to Christ. She said, I'm going to press in. I'm going to come close. And close it was. It wasn't that she was sitting over in the corner as Jesus sat over there on the couch. No, she, she came. She wanted to be close. She wanted to be at the feet of Jesus. She wanted to draw near to her Savior. And that is exactly what she did. She came in close and she drew near to Jesus. I said earlier that Jesus is rebuking Martha, and he is right here in this passage. Martha, Martha. He calls her name twice. He's wanting to get her attention. She's complaining about her sister Mary and what she's doing. She's in there preparing for the, for the thing to take place, the meal to be had later uh, uh, to provide uh, a meal for Jesus and the disciples and to be a good host. But she's missing out on the fact that what is the most important thing is to draw near. And so she rebukes, he rebukes Martha. 
And I said earlier, this is so calming. It's so calming to me to think about it, to understand that it's as simple as just turning to Christ, turning to Jesus, spending time with the Lord. Here's what I hope you see in this text as we kind of draw to a a conclusion here. Mary has found something. Mary has discovered something that literally millions of people live their entire lives and never find. You ready for this? What Mary is finding at the feet of Jesus as she grows near to him is acceptance, peace, and contentment. Acceptance, peace, and contentment. I want you to think about that for just a moment. You know, in those moments in my life where I feel just so overwhelmed because I've just allowed just too much of the wrong stuff to be a part of my life instead of the good stuff to be a part of my life, you know what's missing in my life? Acceptance, peace, and contentment. In the busyness of life, I even, I've already testified to this, I, already, I, I, I try to, to validate myself, my, my doings. I try to validate my busyness as though it's, it's something to be proud of when in fact what I need to do is be still and know that he is God. To press into Jesus, to move in closer to God in those moments where there is no peace, when there, when there is a lack of contentment in my life and I try to find acceptance somewhere else besides Jesus maybe you've been there as well you know I I believe as after 17 years of being the pastor at Cross Point Church I think I have finally realized this and I don't know what that says about me but (laughs) I'm just being transparent with you I think From the moment we planted a church and started pastoring this church and just being driven, I have been more in my life a Martha than I have been a Mary. God has taught me so much. But as I read this passage... As I studied this passage, as I thought about this passage here, I began to realize that the Bible places such a high value on just really getting away in the midst of ministry, in the midst of of busyness, removing ourselves from the situations of life and drawing near to Jesus by sitting at his feet and listening to his words and spending time with the one whom we declare that we have this awesome relationship with. As I was thinking about that, I thought, I can't tell them that. They'll think I'm not close with Jesus. But I'm telling you, it's just what I've really discovered. In my life, there needs to be more Mary than there is Martha. And as I thought about that, I also thought about the reality that that maybe this message is teaching you the same thing that there needs to be more Mary than Martha in your life. What are you distracted by? What does is, what is your life look like? Where do we go from here? You know, it's during the times that Jesus got away that his main purpose was to draw close to the Father. He would remove himself. Sometimes it was just for a short time. Sometimes it was an extended time. But he would remove himself from the distractions. He'd remove himself from the crowds. He would remove himself from the noise. And he would get away to where it was quiet. And the whole purpose was to draw near to the Father. This needs to be a daily rhythm in our life. 
It might be in the morning. It might be in the afternoon. It might be in the middle of the night. It might be in the very, very early morning. But it needs to be a daily rhythm in our life. At the end of June, uh, I am, with the blessings of our shepherding team and our staff, I'm going to take a sabbatical. Been going hard for 17 years. I'm going to take six Sundays off. And I'm kind of going against what a sabbatical really is because I'm calling this a working sabbatical, which is an oxymoron. It's kind of like a large shrimp, right? It just, you're not supposed to work on a sabbatical, but, and maybe God will just, (laughs) he'll convict me further. But but the reason I call it a working sabbatical is because it's going to be a time of much prayer. It's going to be a, a time of really pushing into Jesus and drawing near. It's going to be a time of fasting and meditation. It's going to be a time of, of really just writing and, 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 and putting down what Jesus tells me on paper. It's, it's going to be about a time of visioneering and preparing for the fall to when I return and bring back that vision that God has for us as a church. Like I said, it's not always just about rest. It's about doing the right thing. And I think that one of the greatest lessons that I've learned in reading through this passage is this doesn't need to be an activity that happens every 17 17 years in our life, but rather something that takes place daily. As a daily rhythm because of who we are. We need these Christ centered rhythms in our life, and we just looked at a few. You know, maybe, maybe one of the rhythms that is missing in our life is getting on our knees before God and just spending time in prayer. This altar this morning. It's a great place for that to start. A great place for it to begin. Or maybe during or after the service, you want to sit down with someone who is a mentor or a friend or, or a pastor even. We're here for you to help you walk through what it means to draw near to Jesus. But the reality is If Mary can find acceptance and peace and contentment at the feet of Jesus, I bet you can too. I bet you can too. Let's pray.